So uh, I guess David pointed out to me correctly that the uh, program says this is a lecture, but actually I think what I'll do is I'll talk a little bit about what's going on, and then perhaps we'll try to hold a conversation as, as well as a lecture. So um, I've, what I've done is I've lifted the slides from the working group session that we'd had in November 2011 at Euro BSDCon. I've done a little bit of updating, but a lot of things are still pretty pertinent, so I'll, I'll sort of fairly quickly walk through what's going on. I'm going to assume that people in the audience know something about capsicum. Um, this is probably not entirely true, so I'll sort of I'll review things a little bit, but not very, very much. Um, so uh, Capsicum is this lightweight operating system capability and sandbox framework. Uh, what we mean by that is that we provide some kernel primitives that make certain kinds of sandboxing that have traditionally been quite difficult, perhaps easier to deploy and use. Uh, and in particular, they're driven to a large extent by user space applications in terms of what policies you can deploy. Um, they are targeted at a very specific type of sandboxing problem called compartmentalization, which is not I want my application to follow certain rules, but rather I am the application author and I have many components to my software and I need to control the behavior of those components. So this trend in uh, sort of software design kicked off in mm, sort of mid, late 1990s with some work uh, by Niels Provost in privilege separation and some very similar work by Doug Kilpatrick, um, a system called PrivMan. And if you look at SSHD, you get kind of the, the classic example. You break it into two processes. One of them runs with lots of root privilege. The other runs with significantly less privilege. And that way, uh, when you have vulnerabilities, ideally, you've mitigated them by allowing the exploit only access to a limited set of privileges. So today, we call it application compartmentalization because we're referring to the compartmentalization of large-scale applications. We are interested in applications like Chromium and OpenOffice and so on, although most of the work to date has been done on smaller-scale applications. Uh, you know, gzip and bzip and things like that. Things that uh, exp are, have particularly risky code pods exposed to untrustworthy data. And there are lots of dimensions and strategies you might use for breaking things up. We're interested in a lot of them. Um, and we're starting to deploy these techniques in FreeBSD. So we're using them to both displace compartmentalization already done uh, in the form of privilege separation and base system tools, such as the DHCP client. But we're also adding compartmentalization to some things that traditionally have not had privilege separation in them. And GZIP's a nice example. GZIP doesn't run as root. It runs as whatever user you happen to be logged in as. It deals with uh, you know, potentially quite risky data downloaded from the big lawful internet. Uh, and you're not interested in uh, you know, protecting the specific files from GZIP. What you're interested in is enforcing the policy that GZIP plays by the rules that it was written to. It can take the input from one file and send it to another file. So Capsicum provides facilities such as ephemeral sandboxing uh, without the use of privilege. Um, so this supplements. Uh, existing facilities in the system. The work was originally done in collaboration between Cambridge and Google. Uh, so Ben Laurie, Chris Kennaway at Google, uh, John Anderson and myself at Cambridge. Uh, since then, quite a few other people have gotten involved. Uh, so Pavel has done quite a bit of work on demons in the FreeBSD base as he's added them, um, adding Capsicum support to them. Uh, we also have Ilya Babkin, who was a Summer of Code student last year, uh, has been doing quite a lot of work looking at applications. We have some more folks at Cambridge and elsewhere who are interested in it. Uh, there's also some people at the University of Wisconsin who have tools to automatically apply you know, capsicumization to certain classes of applications, which is a quite an interesting project, quite researchy, but something we find pretty exciting. So I guess the big news since this talk was last given uh, in, at EuroBSDCon is that we now have some new funded work. Uh, so the FreeBSD Foundation and Google will be funding Pavel to do several months of work to provide software infrastructure, make it easier to adjust applications, provide sandbox libraries. So for example, uh, TLS, right? Lots of applications use TLS. We'd like to make it very easy for any application that uses TLS to automatically pull in a sandbox TLS library. So hopefully, if we have a chance to work through some of those, we might spend a couple of minutes brainstorming the kind of applications we'd like them to work on since he's going to have some time. But also, there's a framework around the construction of sandboxed applications that we did a prototype of at Cambridge, and I feel has been one of the weaker parts of the work. That is, it worked, and it allowed us to explore it, but they weren't very mature APIs. And a question for upstreaming this work into FreeBSD is, you know, how can we ensure these APIs are maintainable in the long term? Right? How do we deal with the ABI issues associated with compartmentalization? So uh, in November 2011, um, we sat down and we identified a bunch of areas we thought some work needed to be done. So one of the ones uh, highlighted by Pavel was part of his work with HAST um, was that Certain kinds of operations were simply not permitted in sandboxes at all because we had trouble reasoning about whether they were safe in sandboxes. And IO control was kind of a classic example. And we came up with a, a straw man approach to addressing that. Right now, nothing's happened in the base with respect to that. But I think we actually have a kind of useful answer. 
And we identified some other services, a DNS, for example, supplements TLS quite nicely. It's the kind of thing you want to run from a sandbox application. So it has to be available to TCP dump running in a sandbox, but also you want to run it in its own sandbox. Um, there was also this kind of more general question, which is today uh, we start applications and they tend to launch sandboxes. And so the container application starts out with ambient privilege, the right to access everything in the system. And then you create these little boxes where unprivileged things happen. We'd rather start the application entirely unprivileged and then have you know, the runtime link or application framework provide access to system resources through you know, selective upgrade of privilege. This is completely the inverse of what happens in classic privilege separation, where you say, I hold all privilege, now I'm going to distribute it. So that would be a nice thing to do. We also, in the original work, uh, we adjusted Chromium uh, to use Capsicum. This was collaborative work. Ben Laurie actually did the port of Chromium to FreeBSD to support this research. Um, and I know Chromium is now quite well maintained on FreeBSD, but I think it's this question about the status of the patches. Um, the people at Google are eager for us to upstream those patches. Uh, they have lots of interest in, in using them. Um, so it would be good to do that. I don't know if we have Renee in the audience, in fact. No, possibly not. So he's been maintaining, I think, the, the um, Chromium work. Um, LibCapscum, this is this library we'd like to replace with Pavel's new work. Uh, another thing we were interested in was what does the 9.1 agenda look like? In 9.0, we ship Capscom as an experimental feature. The kernel features are there. They're not enabled by default in the kernel. In 9.1, we'd like to enable them. But everything we enable by default is something that we have to be very sure we got the APIs right on. Because changing them later will be a real pain. So uh, some thought there. There were also a bunch of calls and bits of the functionality that we felt was necessary. Um, so I'll sort of skip ahead. We talked briefly about uh, sort of the IOCTL whitelisting concern uh, and some missing features. But the one I want to get to uh, is actually this one. And this has to do with this. At the time, we're referring to it as Capsicum Services Daemon. I think there's still some disagreement on what exactly we'll call this. In the world of Capsicum, applications are more than one process. Right? They consist of a set of processes that overall make up a logical application. So in a normal application, we have a runtime linker that finds all the components and it assembles them in a single address space. In Capsicum, we need runtime linkers for each address space. And what we actually want is some component that will assemble the whole application and make sure all the pieces are there. So notionally, that thing is also a runtime linker. It's just it's a multi-address space runtime linker. So we already have multi-address space runtime linkers. They're things like LaunchD and Mac OS X, where services and components are launched on demand as required by linkage inside of sub-applications. So we need something that resembles this, but we're not quite sure. Is it a system service? Is it a per login session service? Is it something that just, you know, an extension to the base RTLD that just happens to know about linking additional processes? You know, I, I think an open question. Um, we also have a bunch of services we want to offer. Ideally, this runtime linker has a component model, so you can plug in pieces of code that offer common things you're interested in, so TLS and DNS and, and all these other things. But file services and system monitoring, wouldn't it be nice if top was ran in a sandbox? Well, top has to use all these syscontrols to extract kernel state, so how is it going to get those working inside a sandbox that isn't allowed to name global system resources? Uh, and so on, right? lots and lots of things. Um, so. This is something that I hope Pavel will address directly, but uh, we'll see. We'll talk about that in a moment. The other thing that we spent a few minutes on in November is brainstorming lots of things that we thought deserve some sandboxing. And they were everything from system mount daemons that have had vulnerabilities in the past to third-party applications that are quite sizable, right? So KDE, we'd love to run lots and lots of parts of KDE in sandboxes. We don't want a global system policy for how KDE should behave. I think that would be silly, right? You don't know how the web browser bits of KDE will behave until you started clicking on links. On the other hand, we also know that KDE links against a lot of very risky code. Um, happily, KDE comes with these IOS layers, which are nicely already running in separate processes, components that might lend themselves to, uh, to being wrapped up in the sandboxes. So yeah, and I think I'm very careful to say that we, we want to take responsibility for doing this to FreeBSD code, but we want to encourage people to do it to non-FreeBSD code. Uh, and suddenly, caps, uh, so Chromium was a nice example of that. I'm full face package NG because every time we talk about package managers, uh, lots of people think we should do something involving security. Um, maybe sandboxing is a part of that security. So I have said lots of words. I'm going to present what I think is a, the plan, and then maybe we can actually talk a bit about Pavel's work. So uh, in 9 to 0, as I said, not in generic. Um, in 9 to 1, I would like to put it in generic. This means that we must not change the system call APIs non-trivially after that without a great deal of thought. So we need to be very happy with our system call APIs. Um, I'd also like in 9.1 for us to start working through the base system and making them sandbox, bits of, of code sandbox. So I want to go for two kinds of things. I want to go for the most security critical code in terms of things the system requires to boot and run, let people log in, stuff like SSHD and so on. But also 
um, some code that has really been ignored in sandboxing work to date, and that's tools like gzip, uh, you know, tar, things that deal with very risky things, uh, do complex data processing on untrustworthy stuff. Um, so if we can dig into that, that would really be good. Right. So maybe we should have a conversation. I should stop just talking to you. So. Obviously, yeah, no, no, actually, this weekend, right? It's clearly, I mean, yeah, we have an ambitious weekend. Can you turn it off? Right. The intent is to allow everything to be compiled out. Okay. Yeah. So one of the one of the implications of the design of Capsicum is more processes, and we know that in lower end embedded systems, more processes is bad. So we need to be able to turn the stuff off. Some of the Capsicum stuff doesn't have significant overhead. The cost of taking something which uh, TCP dump is kind of an interesting example, right? So TCP dump at the front does a lot of things that require privilege, like open BPF and put you know uh, interfaces into promiscuous mode. And then at some point, it enters a steady state where it just processes extremely evil data and does very dangerous things, right? So it sits there passing SNMP and packets that you know, just randomly come off the internet. Um, the cost of entering a sandbox is nil for that, right? So once you're in the sandbox, there's no ongoing cost to it. So in that case, the argument for disabling it is a bit weaker. Also, we already do unconditional privilege separation and things like SSHD. So we can reinforce the SSHD sandboxes using Capsicum, and they become better sandboxes. So in that case, are you still interested in turning that off, or you're just worried about the overhead of GZIP launching more processes? Code size. Yeah, bloat, sure. Yeah, I understand. I feel that way about 802.11 as well, so you know, it, it's good. Uh, <laughs> no, I agree. Uh, modularity is good. We like modularity. And right now, everything about Capsicum is conditionally compiled. The base kernel overhead of Capstone is actually almost negligible, right? It's a very, very small change. It's much smaller than all kinds of other things, like asynchronous I.O. or something like that. This is quite, quite compact for the, for sort of the minimalist sandbox set. The, the place where you begin to pick up bloat, I mean infrastructure, uh, is in user space libraries where you want components that are going to get linked in and changes to runtime linkers, right? And that stuff will all be conditionally compilable. That said, it would be very nice if it were conditionally compiled but enabled on all the platforms that really benefit from it. And I don't think we should exclude embedded world from that because the kinds of things you like to run in small embedded appliances like access points uh, often are subject to these kinds of security oh, vulnerabilities. I, I, wanted right. to, I want to make it work on embedded appliances. Yeah, yeah well, I mean, it will make it work on embedded. Don't worry. I mean, that's fine, right? But we'd like to be able to manage the overhead of that. The same way we'd like to manage the overhead of just about everything else in the base. So. I think there's a hand back here. Jordan. There was, yeah, yeah. I can, I can email you a copy. It's only 200 pages. Yeah, so that's a good question. So we're very careful not to answer that question in the research that we did previously because we promote a model which allows you to answer that question. Um, but more generally, if you look at Mac OS X as a reference, right, uh, it, the mechanisms that are here are very similar in some ways to some of the work that's done with mock ports, which implies MIG and a lot of other stuff on top of it. I don't, well, MIG and, yeah. Yeah, well, whatever you want to call it this week. So, but an RPC generator, effectively, right? We're not allowed to use the word MIG. We're not allowed to call it an RPC generator, but it does build stubs that run on both sides of message busing. Sure, no, no, but it still builds stubs on both sides of message busing. So how do you how do you generate the messages? Right. So code is generated. So you're saying you're shifting away from RPC towards explicit message passing? Absolutely. Right. So yeah. So the ma the masking of distributed systems properties in a distributed system causes problems with like, failure modes and reliability and performance and transparency and debuggability and blah, 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 blah. yeah. So right now in Capsicum everything is explicit, right? But we don't. What we haven't done, in part because a moderate amount of the work was to adapt existing privilege separated applications, is adopt a framework for generalized message passing for representation of stuff. Right. And I assume this is something that XCP does help solve by saying, I help you bundle up your information in a way that allows you to communicate it effectively. Right. Right. So we haven't 
explicitly adopted something there in large because all the applications we work with really had it already, especially Chromium is a perfect example of an application that wants your solution. It has at least a dozen handcrafted you know, message passing mechanisms with fill out structures and send them back and forth. And we keep prodding the Google people and they keep saying, we know it's a problem. So, uh, so I don't want to repeat their answer, right? It is an exercise left to read today. So Ben Laurie has a prototype uh, generator that helps bundle things up with a bit of help from, uh, you know, here's what my message is. The message, here's what my API is, right? Help me build things and build the data structures and so on. And it required a bit of changing compared to traditional RPC stuff, not just because it's not RPC, because it doesn't do the, the language bindings, but also because the kind of things we want to pass around are a little different, right? We want to pass around references to objects and that kind of thing. So I think you can, the structural comparison you're making is entirely right. And maybe, maybe XCP is the solution that we should be using. I don't know. We can certainly talk about that. If you have a, if you have a nice solution to the problem of this, to this problem, then I think we'd like a nice solution. We have a nice problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, well, something compact, small, C-friendly, right? Uh, able to deal with ABI differences, and I guess that's probably part of your problem space as well, right? I mean, if we're running a 32-bit thing in the sandbox, why should it not be able to talk to a 64-bit service, right? And I assume that's in your space. I mean, I think there's a very nice comparison mentioned earlier to be made between launch D and friends and what you might effectively think of as a multi-process linker, right? I mean, they, they solve the same problem, but at a slightly different scale. Do you have documentation available for XPC? It's just that it's just the code's not available currently. Right. So this sounds like it might be a case where it's missing a few things in the base system, but as you all see, we like this stuff and mm. we like that and that. Right. It's yeah. It, well, right. So I mean, it's not quite as much so as libdispatch, right. right? So the case with libdispatch was uh, there's almost nothing in the base system that uses threads heavily, and so the argument for shifting away from threads to a more mature dispatch model is is weakened by the fact that there's just not that much to convert, right? Whereas on the base system, we actually have a lot of components that would benefit from compartmentalization because we have many system management tools that deal with things. I mean, look at uh, FreeBSD update, right? FreeBSD update goes out, and maybe it downloads things using HTTPS, and they're compressed, and then it's going to do binary updates, and it's going to validate signatures, and it's going to do certificate. I mean, you know, the chain of vulnerabilities that it can exist in that pipeline is truly impressive, and almost all of them have been exploitable. So. You know, that kind of thing really would lend itself to a solution that says, I have modular services. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. there, there is a nice base system application to be had. I, I agree that the really interesting problem is monolithic applications to make a comparison to microkernels and, you know, it's sort of bad word, but, you know, effectively what we're doing is promoting the microkernel model. We're saying you're going to start decomposing and linking using message passing. That means you have to be aware of the cost, and some of the, some of the costs are not just performance costs, but debuggability costs, right? If you, you know, you're turning things into little distributed systems, which we know is a, a painful and bad thing to do when you don't have to. Um, but on the other hand, we've counted the number of lines of code in the, you know, the FreeBSD kernel, right, sort of a few million lines, four million lines, depends on what you count, right? And then we counted the number of lines of code in Chromium, and we thought, oh, there's four million to start with, and then there's another two million lines here. A very comparable scale of project. Right. So I think the, the philosophy espoused by Capscom is kind of this ca object capability view of the world that says you're delegated rights to things. This implies modification of code, right? So the things that want to be sandbox have to be somehow aware of it. Now that modification of code doesn't have to be, you know, above the POSIX layer. It could be below the POSIX layer. So there's a guy, uh, Mark Seaborn, who's done something called Plash, which uses a capability model under the hood, but then implements libc on top of it. So he's able to do all kinds of, you know, you can only access this directory and that directory fairly transparently. I feel that that approach has a moderate amount of overhead. I actually think the best argument, you know, for where to place this stuff is in uh, libraries, for example, where you might sit on the other side of a library API that's not been modified and then internally spawn sandboxes to process things. And then you end up with a bunch of design choices about granularity. Um, 
my temptation on a capability shell will be not to merge anything until such time as we're really happy with it. Because I think any time you put something like a new shell in the system, you know, you find yourself committing to APIs and user interface choices. And I think that right now that work is not yet mature. I think there's very exciting ideas there, but I'm not sure what the timeline for them becoming exciting and mature is. So, but but Calmly is very interested. I think the, the project is clearly a good one. I mean, it's not giving up, right? But, it, but in some ways, if the goal is compartmentalization, then philosophically, that's a different problem. Like, I'm not opposed to sandbox techniques, such as, I mean, Mac OS X you know, has sandbox. You put these little policy files, and it uses our Mac framework you know, transposed to, to Mac OS X. And that's a very useful technique for constraining applications where you have a list of all the objects they have to access statically available. Where that technique tends to break down is in cases where you have applications that are general purpose. You don't know what app files they're going to, they're going to access. And not only that, is not the application that's the object of, you know, the subject of interest. It's components inside the application. Uh, and they're a delegation model which is driven by code and user behavior and whatever else. You know, um, you know power boxes, right? The sort of example is and the dialog box pops up. The dialog box has ambient privilege in the system. You click on the file, you click open. Okay, now the right to use that file is delegated to the thing running in the sandbox. So John has a version of a KDE editor that does this, right, on FreeBSC using Capsicum. That is not impossible to implement using conventional sandbox systems, but it is a bit unnatural to implement it that way. Well, they benefit a lot more because they're really pretty vulnerability prone, large, yeah, scary things, cool. right? That already come with, in particular, KDE is interesting because it already is object oriented, right? And you can kind of see. In the background behind all this, you know, a gesture in the direction of object-oriented programming. Are there, any, are there any plans in your mind to try and uh, seek funding for your group or seek funding for the KDE group to actually work on this? So our view is we, there, there was missing software infrastructure to really be effective on large-scale user place applications. Right. And that the solution for that was to implement that. So that's why we went back to Google and the FreeBSD Foundation to fund some additional work. I think once Pavel's done his work, we're in a very strong place to start investigating things to do on a larger scale. Another thing that would really help is wider adoption of the Capsicum APIs in other operating systems. And there are ongoing conversations in a number of communities about what might happen there. Certainly, you know, Google has been very supportive of this project and would be interested in seeing the technology used more. So, right. so yeah, and, 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 Je and Jordan's sitting in the back of the room, so we can chat with him later. But, you know. Right. But it, is, but it is interesting, right? I mean, in KDE, if they use libjpeg, and our libjpeg has cute sandboxy stuff inside of it transparently, KDE benefits right. without actually being modified. Right. Right? And there are some interesting things you have to do the process model to make that the case. Right. Right? If, if your library is going to launch processes, you know, the Unix signal and you know, sig child and so on get awkward. Right? So that's why we have to have new primitives to allow us to solve that problem. Oh, uh, we don't want to talk about multics here because we like multics and we're not allowed to say that. <laughs> You should, as, as Jordan kindly recommended, you should read my PhD dissertation, which recently went online as a technical report. <laughs> Fortunately, we have shorter papers, and there's a, there's a recent one in communications PACM on it, which is like six pages, which is slightly shorter than 200 pages. It's probably, yeah, and you can use it later for other things, too. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, and it's, it's better than the 8211 spec. Right, okay. Um, any other sort of thoughts or questions? I think maybe, Pavel, you might tell us a bit about what you're planning to do if there are no other almost out of time, I think, so. Do you want to say a few words? Your program is to sell and 
I mean, there's a moderate on argument that the OpenSSL API was never designed for this. And therefore, you find yourself wanting to create a new API for crypto that it does align with the model better. I think I, I guess I. Oh, absolutely. Right, I mean, but there's a, there's a, there's a, the part of the problem, though, is that there's a selection of trade-off points, right. right, where you're trying to balance mitigation of vulnerabilities you know about or vulnerabilities you don't know about against performance. What we end up being tasked to do then is allow people to make choices as they build their applications as to what's going on. But what we might find we need, I think, which is what Pavel is suggesting, is that we need APIs that allow us to mask which actual implementation choices have been made. Oh, absolutely right. Which is why I mean we have done quite a bit of work to modify things to use these, but I come un, I come out of it unsatisfied with some of the results. So I think we need to think carefully about that. I want to mention Pavel's point on policy. One of the nice things about approach like Capsicum is you start with the assumption that no one has the rights to anything, and therefore you now need to build up a set of rights which various components have. A traditional way to do this would be to say uh, we have endpoints, you know, IPC endpoints that refer to objects or sessions. And therefore, we only delegate those who are allowed to have them. We would never, perhaps, delegate rights to use the key, the private key, outside. And we'd have a consumer endpoint which allows requests to come in. But we'd never you know, actually accept a request to reveal the private key from one that was only supposed to go to sandboxes that aren't supposed to get it. Right? That's how you build up. If you, if, if, to make a slightly awkward comparison to Java, right? if you have a bunch of Java classes and objects and so on, you wouldn't pass in a reference to your private key to a piece of sandbox code that's not supposed to use it you would pass in a reference to an object that allows you to make a very limited set of requests, right, that in turn implement crypto without necessarily revealing the key. So that's not an unreasonable way to think about it. And the way you construct the web of rights is by saying, well, the way I set up IPC channels controls the rights that have been delegated. Um, there's an interesting tension with static policies, which you can analyze easily and look at on disk and dynamic policies implemented in this kind of way. But you can imagine CSD, right, providing a nice spec file that allows you to say, yes, I have these four components, and these are the ones I'm going to delegate rights to. And then the mechanism sets up the web of rights so that you get the policy that you want. Thank you. 
I mean, the, one of the benefits, I mean, one of the reasons why you also end up with design choices like LaunchD and Mac OS X is that you don't want random things forking and producing new processes that have very limited functionality. So the best example of Mac OS X was uh, the Windows server forking and exacting uh, applications on application start. You know, you take your Windows server with a billion memory mappings of different windows and things, you fork the whole thing, replicating the entire address space, which you then immediately throw away so that you can go and exec bin sh, right? And that is a kind of structure you'd like to avoid. Uh, CSD does address that, but there's also a set of design choices there. You don't eliminate certain costs, and you pretty quickly end up with um, like the zygote idea they have in Chromium, where they say, well, you know, if we're going to be creating lots of these sandboxes and they're going to taste the same, or like the one that occurs in KDE, right? They keep around pools of worker processes as templates for services that they need to create on demand to mitigate runtime linking costs and initialization costs and all this stuff. So you get forced down that avenue of design choices. Probably the biggest risk in this kind of work is you know, how do we avoid picking up reliability and robustness problems that you get out of more complex construction? So I think one imperative in building a system like this is to be able to turn it off, right? To be able to say, yes, you can run this thing in the same address space, or you can run it in a separate address space. That helps you with debuggability as well. Right? Um, so that, but that means that the glue that sits between needs to be a little bit flexible and not committed to the mechanism, which is probably healthy anyway, because we might decide not unreasonably in a year's time. Well, Unix domain sockets are great, but they were never designed for this. Possibly we should have a new IPC mechanism. Will it look like doors? Will it look like mock IPC? I don't know. But that will be a natural choice when you realize you really care a lot about latency and message size and passing references and that kind of thing. I see Jordan raise his hand. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Right. And that stuff comes up a lot in distributed object systems, right? I mean, we, you, you want to be careful not to pick up too many of the nasty properties of uh, distributed systems programming and local application programming, because we know that's pretty difficult anyway. But I think you're forced in that direction, so you just have to reason about it. Yeah. OK, we're probably running out of time, I think. So thank you, everyone. And hopefully, you, people who are interested in Capsicum will uh, stay in touch and chat more, and we'll watch Pavel's work. Thanks.